One of the things we should have mentioned that we haven't is we're wearing suits on this wonderful podcast, yes. or a tux in my case. Yeah. Uh, we're I going to the Magic time. Castle. Yes. And how did you become a magician, or you're a hobbyist magician? I'm a hobbyist magician. Mostly it's after a few drinks, and mostly just magic tricks for friends and family. Um, I have, you know, just been doing magic. I don't know, was it just interested as a kid? Mm -hmm. My older brother, one of my older brothers would do little tricks for me, and I always liked it. I grew up, kind of date myself a little bit here, but I grew up in the 80s and 90s when David Copperfield was... Everything. Right. It was yeah. everything, right? And he he was come. like the only magician. He had a monopoly on the magician name. Basically. You couldn't like say Doug magician. Henning was in the 70s, and then Copperfield came around in the 80s and 90s, really. Like yeah. Two decades, he pretty much owned it. Uh, you had Penn and Teller and those guys, but like sure. Copperfield was the guy. And at that time, he was still touring. He made the Statue of Liberty disappear, I think. <laughs> Among other things, yeah. <laughs> um, in a 747 jet. Yeah. Yeah. On television stuff. <laughs> Yeah. So I would watch those annual specials all the time. I would always, you know, for a birthday present, ask my mom to, to take me to his show here in, in Hollywood when he would come through. So I'd always been into it. And then, as you know, just as a kid and as a hobby, and it, and it sort of faded away. I don't know, kind of got uncool, I think, in high school. <laughs> sure. And then I got in, you know, I went to college and, and uh, just didn't have time for it. And it kind of faded away as a hobby. And then fast forward to when I was in my early 30s, randomly met this guy, Alan, who's now a good friend of mine, at a totally different, unrelated architecture uh, thing. I was a, um, an Eames Foundation member. Okay. Um, and we were at this lunch, and he was there, and just got it started talking about things, and he ended up being a Magic Castle member. So he asked me if I'd ever been, and I had been a couple times. Tell people what the Magic Castle is. Okay, so we have Magic listeners Castle from all around the country. A private, members-only clubhouse for the Academy of Magical Arts. So if you've heard of like the Academy of Motion Pictures, right, for movies. So this is the Academy of Magical Arts. And it's uh, been around for 50-plus years. It's, a, it, it's in a old Victorian mansion in the Hollywood Hills, not far from the Man's Chinese Theater and all those areas. It was created by two brothers back in the 60s for uh, their father was a magician and they were in the magic as well and they wanted to create a private clubhouse for magicians. And it has since evolved and turned into one of the most exclusive clubs really in LA and yeah. the world in the, you know, for at least in the magic world. And you have to be a member, to, member or a guest of a member to go. And so they have a dining area, they have five different showrooms, they have five different bars and it's just a fun place to go stadium see some of the seating best magicians that come through on a weekly basis and uh yeah you can see everything from close-up card and coin magic to grand stage illusions and everything in between and, and the building itself is full of gags and tricks and things like that it's really cool uh, and it's you have to dress formal in fact i need to put on a tie <laughs> so they're very strict about the dress code and, and you have to be wearing a suit or a you know a cocktail dress or something and when you met your friend, did you did, was he teaching you, Alan? Was yeah, he teaching so he wasn't you magic? Teaching me, but he okay. would bring me as a guest. And okay, I started going, and because I, I still had liked it, you know, I still, you know, by that time, who doesn't like magic? Yeah, David Blaine was on TV, and you know, so I would always watch those kinds of things, and I would still do some card tricks here and there. So I started going to the Magic Castle as his guest, and then it was really like a bucket list thing for me, where as a kid I had known about the Magic Castle growing up in LA. And I'd always wanted to be a member back then. Um, and so I just said, you know what? I'm going to get back into this and practice my ass off. And I'm going to, you have to audition to become a member. Um, and I'm going to audition by the time I turn 35. And this is a couple years into it. So I probably gave myself a year, just over a year. And so got back in and sort of like riding a bike. A lot of the fundamentals are, I still already knew. I just had to practice and mm -hmm. get warmed up again. But I started going like, as a guest of his like three times a week and watching observing, watching and and practicing my routine to anybody that would listen so any of the member the magician members that were there i would say hey can you can i do this routine for you can you give me critiques and help me so yeah so they do auditions the first monday of every month my birthday 35th birthday was on a sunday so i auditioned the very next day and i got it that's amazing is, you know i think they have maybe 25 percent audition get in something like that 
Do they give you a card? What do they give you? A card? A card. Like a, <laughs> like a, they what do. do they give you? So you, you do. So you get a, a member card, not a card, a card. <laughs> uh, you get this pin. Oh, wow. You can see here. So this is the gold. Well, what's on our, it? Our magician members. It's their, sort of like their crest. A crest. Okay. It's an owl in the middle, which is sort of his magic castle kind of mascot. Okay. This is, is there an Mars. esoteric meaning to this? That you want to tell us? No, I'm just kidding. No, <laughs> no? Okay. No, no. We're just going to go afterwards. So mag magician members, when you're there, you typically wear the pin so that people know you're a member if you're there. How does one learn magic? So I know like, so in my head, right, you can go to Toys R Us or no longer. I guess I go on Amazon.com and I can purchase like how to do magic, a kit. Yeah. Is that? Those are, that's the kids stuff, right? A kit. Okay. The best way. I don't know. How do you... The best way is the old fashioned way. Pick up a book. Okay. And start reading fundamentals. Of course, there's tons of stuff on YouTube now and everything, but really, if you're serious, the books, books, and, and reading is you know it's still the best way. And then practicing in the mirror, yeah. and recording you know, you can, yourself. You can use the videos as as supplements, I think, to to your learning if you can't figure some out or you want to see how other people are doing it. But um, and there's different, you know, there's different books that are written in different ways for different learning styles. There's some that are written like textbooks. Where you really just build on fundamentals wow. and next step, there's a whole series called Card College that's like textbook style. Wow. Um, the Magic Castle has a massive library as well with books that date back to like 1600s, I think, or something like that um, in this vault. But they just have a massive amount of that's cool uh, material there. So that's the best way. Or, you know, taking classes too. They have oh, okay, Magic yeah. Castle has classes, other magicians teach classes. And then you have this amazing story if you'd shared okay. about Pete sure. Carroll. Yeah. So I went to USC. I was a huge, still am, huge USC football fan. I went before Pete Carroll was there. But Pete Carroll was the coach for USC um, during some of the best of the recent years where it won some national championships. And, of course, I was loving it as a fan, a football fan. But I was also really interested in his philosophy or what he was doing to win. Because we were winning we won for like two years straight, right? Or more, I think it was something like 30 something games in a row. Reggie um, Bush, Reggie Matt Bush, Liner. Matt Liner, all those guys. Yeah. yeah. Period. So I get the USC, uh, I went to Marshall School of Business, so I get the Marshall uh, Magazine, alumni magazine thing that they sent out. And they had written an article about Pete in there and interviewed him about how he gets, basically how he gets his team to play without fear of losing. They play knowing they're going to win. For them, it's just like going to practice and they just do what they need to do, not fearing. And he has, I think, his master's in sports psychology. Something like okay. that. So he kind of brings in a little bit of um, law of attraction almost, thinking into it, where you put your intentions out there and they manifest. So I know you said earlier that you're not into that, but... Uh, no, but it happens. But it, ha it does happen. It it's, does work. I'm not into it because it sounds crazy, but it, it always happen. happens. Totally so does. because of that, I'm into it. It's just hard to explain, right? I feel like it needs the word like magic, such a good marketing word. We need to create a word that's Here's not proof that it works. When we side note, and I'll come back to the story. One of our very first pitch decks when we were pitching to Ideal Lab people, so at the very beginning. I don't think this is advice anymore, but we had a slide in there for <laughs> exit strategy. And no. we always thought we were going to be acquired by a strategic and we had listed some of the companies that we thought would Acquire us back then, and GoDaddy was at the very top of the list. So anyway, back to the Pete Carroll thing. Law of attraction. He didn't really say law of attraction. They didn't say that in the article, but it was all about putting your intentions out there, playing like you're gonna win. And I just thought it was fascinating. And so I wanted to know as a leader, it's cool that he thinks that, but how does he get his, his assistant team. coaches and his team okay. to think that? Right. And play, and work that way, especially the coach, the other coaches, right? And these are high level. Coaches. Right, super elite athletes in some cases, coaches, the whole bit. Right, yeah. Offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator. Like, it's one thing for the head coach to come in, and these are college kids, so I, you know, I can imagine, it's, and he's a very charismatic, energetic guy, so they're going to listen to him and buy into him, but you don't want the rest of the staff rolling their eyes. And so I'm like, how does he do that? And, you know, and again, as leading a company, I wanted to do that with my team as well. So I wrote him a letter. Physically got out a piece of paper and wrote it. Didn't email it. Didn't even type it and sign it. You know, I wrote it. And I sent him a letter in 
Right around, just right around the holidays. So right around like November, December of, so 2007 or 2008. Okay. Somewhere around there. And I didn't hear anything until after the holidays, like after the season ended and he got back from vacation or whatever. It's probably around March or April. And I got a letter back saying, hey, would love to have you come out. I wrote him a letter and said, I would love to know. I read this article. I would love to know how you do this with your team. Can I come shadow you for the day? Is there a reason you hand wrote it? Just to, I felt like the email would just get lost and it would probably go to his assistant. Right. I've got and it. I just okay. Felt like it would be received. And, yeah. Um, so I got one back and uh, he said, I'd love to have you come out. Let's start with you coming out to see a practice and we can talk about it afterwards in my office. So cool. So I booked it with his assistant and went out and went to one of the practices. And then afterwards said, Hey, you know, Brian, I'm the guy that wrote you a letter. And he said, yeah, come up to my office and chat. So we went up there and told him what I was talking about and what I was doing. And he gave me some books to read or told me, you know, some titles of books to read. And I said, okay, how about that shadowing? I'd love to shadow <laughs> you for the day. And he's like, okay, you know, let's make that happen. So I scheduled it with his assistant again and they sent me the schedule and I showed him a couple weeks later, they start at like six in the morning, six thirty, something like that. Yep. And I, and I go to like ten at night, nonstop. This dude has so much energy; it's amazing. It was impossible. It was like impossible. To six to ten. Something like that. Six thirty. Yeah. I mean, we were there early. Okay. And uh, I sat and followed him around everywhere. Went to all the coaches' meetings. Went to they were calling recruits. Went to practice, morning practice, afternoon practice. Had lunch with them. Like spent the whole day watching tape. It was awesome. So as a football fan, super awesome just to be involved. And so followed him around the whole day. It was, and it was just awesome. And I saw, you know, some of that just comes natural to him. And because he's so charismatic and energetic, he just draws a following. And people want to listen and, and follow him and, and win, right? And uh, so I thought it was just really cool. And thanked him. And he's like, well, you think this was cool. You should come back in the fall, like right before, like end of summer, right before the season starts, that's when the energy is really buzzing. So I'm like, all right. So I scheduled another session in early August of that year to go back just before the season after summer break, a couple of weeks before the first uh, game and did a whole nother day shadowing him around. And, and then after that, end up doing some volunteer work for his charity called the Better LA that his daughter was running at the time and just really honestly trying to give back and like I felt like he was so generous with his time with me and yeah that I wanted to like somehow thank him and give back and I felt like donating my time would be a nice way to do that but what were any key takeaways that you can share with everyone around I guess either his philosophy or having a philosophy having a philosophy so I ha- you need to have a philosophy you need to know what you stand for if you want to be a good leader and you want to win in anything need to know what your philosophy is and what you stand for and, and you should be able to articulate it in a way that other people can understand it and, uh, and digest it quickly yeah he got the idea from john wooden the famous mm. ucla basketball coach yeah who also kind of has that same he did have that same like philosophy i think the winningest college basketball coach yeah i think very much time so. yeah yeah and so Pete had, you know, some unsuccessful years in the NFL, including with the Pats. And, right. Uh, That's right. Yeah. And had to take a moment and, and after being fired a couple times, take a step back and figure out what he stood for. And he figured that out and then came to SC and implemented it as sort of a test. And it worked for him. Yeah. It was awesome. And he did well the Seahawks. Well, too. Do you still keep Almost in touch? Won two Super Bowls Almost. Goddamn pass. <laughs> it's there's bo- there's so many books. Not, not the Patriots. There's a um, there's a I think Annie I think Annie Duke writes a book about that you should focus on process and not results. And she's a poker player. And in the book, she cites which is the the funniest thing that a poker player would do. She cites Pete Carroll's decision to throw on that play. And she gives the statistics of why that was the right thing to do. But everyone critiques the result. And in poker, you never do that. You just, it's all about, and I think in life, right? The successful people figure out, just focus on the process and the results. um, Statistically speaking, were, he was doing the right thing. 
but it just didn't, the I result the right didn't thing. work out. I think it was probably overthought, right? Like, okay, you know, we're going to throw, <laughs> that'll give us one more chance if he doesn't catch it. Like, it was just when the simple answer was give the ball to your running back and have him just pound it in and you win. Like, if you right. win, win the whole second leg. And that's the right, safe thing to do. It seems like it was, he wasn't wrong in deciding to throw, but it was just overthought. It's crazy. Shout out to Malcolm Butler, by the way. MVP of the game. <laughs> Got a free truck from Tom Brady. I think Tom Brady was the MVP, but ended up giving Malcolm the keys of the of the Chevy. Yeah.